There's a guy in Chabad, very much connected to Chabad, who is a horse trainer, trainer of race horses. And one day he was commuting, he was coming to New York from New Jersey, where he was where he was working, and he turned on the radio and he heard the Rebbe speaking in Yiddish, and he said, "This is my language." His 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 family were from Ukraine. His grandfather, a trainer of horses or raised horses, he felt like he fit right in. Did Dalia, Dalia Goodman, and he became very outspoken. Uh, supporter of the Rebbe and the Rebbe's ideas and the Rebbe's campaigns and everything. And he wouldn't work on Shabbos after that. Okay. Robin Gar. Robin Gar. Yes, Miss, Mrs. Ms. Gar. You hit a home run yesterday, Ms. Gar. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Now who who is who who are you? Remind me who you are. Rivka Ram. Ah, you weren't here yesterday, right? Rivka Ram. Okay. Give me a few more days, Rivka. I'll get to know you. Batya, where's Batya? There's Batya. Yes. Okay. Batya was given her name by Hashem Himself, right? And so were you. Yeah, it's just your parents were fine. Where's Rachel? I'm not here yet. She's here. There you are. There you are. And Hannah Ruman. Is there anybody whose name I did not call? Yes. Shush, shush. Shasha Hossid. <laughs> okay. Now, to understand all these questions that the, uh, the Arab is asking, especially this big question how could Rabba think he was a Bainan? So if someone of the statue of Rabbah thought that he was a Benini, top of page 41, it says it's obvious that a person isn't learning Torah full out the whole time. He's a wicked person. That can't be. Now we have another factor here, which I didn't mention yet, that we're trying to figure out also who is a, who is who deserves to be called a wicked person. And that's also a very difficult thing to understand because it seems like. Who am I going to say is a way? What are we going to say? A wicked person is someone who doesn't keep the laws of the Torah. Doesn't keep Shabbos. A person doesn't keep Shabbos. Can't say he's righteous. He may do righteous things, but he can't say when he's not keeping Shabbos, he's not being righteous. A person doesn't put on tefillin. Can't say he's righteous. He may do righteous things. He may do the most righteous thing. He may... He may give up his life to save the life of another, another Jew in battle in Israel. So then he becomes a complete tzaddik. At that moment, he becomes a complete tzaddik. But until then, he just has a chance to put on tefillin, doesn't take the chance, doesn't want to put on tefillin. 
Can't say he's righteous. Okay, so maybe a wicked person keeps the mitzvahs that are written in the Torah. Well, I might suggest a wicked person would call him a wicked person because he, he really does mitzvahs. But mitzvahs of the rabbis, the rabbinical injunctions, rabbinical teachings, he's not so careful about them. Like I keep Pesach, I have matzahs and wine on Pesach, but on the weekdays of Pesach, maybe I go to work. Say to say, you shouldn't go to work, it's a, it's a festival. So maybe that's, that makes a person into a wicked person because he doesn't keep the teachings of the sages. No, no that, that doesn't work either because now he's gonna bring a, a proof from the Talmud that if a person here on page 40, 40, person on 40, if a person violates a minor prohibition of the rabbis, he's called a Russia in the, in the Talmud, in, in the, the Talmud Yavamas. You know, Yavamas is about, it's a very difficult section of the Talmud, very, very complicated. About what happens if a Person passes away, a man dies, leaving no children. So Torah has an unusual law here that the widow should marry the brother of the man who, who died, and they'll have a child named after the brother, so that the brother's name will not be obliterated. So that's, she's called the Yavama, and the brother-in-law is called the Yavam, there's a whole track there because it gets very, very, very confusing with all these relationships. So it says there that if a person doesn't keep a minor injunction of the rabbis, he's called a wicked person. So that's a problem, another problem we're going to have to deal with. And then it gets even stricter. It's not just that he doesn't keep... Uh, teaching, he doesn't give the teaching of the rabbis, but what about a person who keeps all the laws of the Torah, keeps all the teachings of the rabbis, but he has a neighbor who doesn't. And he doesn't try and influence his neighbor. Let's say fair, it's called in America. Let everybody do what they want. He doesn't try to influence his neighbor. And if he had tried, maybe he could have had a good influence on his neighbor. He's called a wicked person. In other words, we have a response. We cannot just enclose ourselves in our righteousness and leave the whole world to go be damned. Or to, to uh, take a metaphor from this week's Parsha, we can't go into Noah's Ark for a year while the flood waters rage and we're okay because we're in the ark. So we're, we're going to enclose ourselves in our righteousness and leave the whole world to go in somewhere. That's, that's called wicked. Where is it called wicked? In the, the tractate about Shavuos, which is about oaths. Shavuos, Shavuos is an oath. We have the festival of weeks. A week is called a Shavuot and an oath is called a Shavuot. It's like uh, the same word used for two different contexts. So we have a festival called Shavuos about the giving of the Torah at the end of seven weeks. And it's about the oaths that we took when Hashem gave us the Torah. What were the two oaths that Hashem, that we, that we gave to Hashem? We're going to do it. We promise we'll do it and we're going to learn about it. So these are the two oaths that every one of us made. We were all there. You may not remember it, but you're... Your, your psyche remembers it. It's buried in your subliminal consciousness. I can't hear you, dear. It could be, it could be interesting if we could remember. It would be interesting if we could remember. It would be interesting if you could. Well, you can, if you work at it. Oh, I see. So when we're learning Torah, we're actually relearning what they, the, all, all this was taught to us before we were born, and we, then we promised. Oh, yeah. So we're relearning what we already knew. There are people 
there are records of people who remembered everything they learned before they were born. They weren't happy about it because they had no, they, could, they didn't accomplish anything. There was no challenge to learning. They remembered everything from before they were born because there, there was an angel that taught them everything. Don't you wish, Mrs. Gar, that that was in your case, you remembered everything from before you were even able to play, grab a baseball bat? I actually do remember a lot. Mm. Wow, no, no, no end of surprises in this class. Last week, we had somebody who had a near-death experience and told us all about it. And now you're telling me that you remember what happened before you were born. Mostly when I was, I guess, about nine months. When you were what? When I was about nine months. When you were nine months old, after you were born. Yeah. Oh, that's a different. That's a different ball game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just kidding. No, mostly. It's it's very unusual. Very unusual. Yes, Rachel. So the people who like remember things from before they were born, what they were from all taught them. Do they have a filtrum? The what? Do they have a filtrum like this thing here? Uh, this thing here? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I heard that. Maybe yes. Maybe no. Went. It's a good question. I think once I heard such a version, of, uh, then the person he didn't have that little mark there, because they they says when you're born, the end, there's an angel comes and smacks you right underneath your nose, so you forget everything. You know when you get a smack in that area, you see the stars. You know why that is. You know why? Because the nose is where your life comes into you. It says Hashem. Last week we read in the Torah, Hashem blew life into the nostrils of. Adam, and uh, in ancient times, this was when they didn't have the electric, all the electrical equipment to check your a pulse and if your your heartbeat and your blood pressure. They used to put a feather under your nose if if your breathing moved the feather. They knew you were still alive because the life. And I, I saw once a painting in a museum by a Dutch painter called Bruegel of a, a person who had died. And there was a little mini person, a little menshi coming out of his nose, being escorted by two angels who were taking him up to heaven. That is like the soul, taking the soul. And then beyond that, there, were, there was another similar person with two angels taking him up to heaven. So I would, I understand that now is, and, and, a whole series, a whole conveyor belt of angels taking these little guys up to heaven. And I would, I would interpret that where you could say, well, they're taking out this whole production line of uh, angels taking souls up to heaven. Or you could interpret it more in lines with the teaching of the Tanya that every soul has so many different levels. So you got different angels taking every level of the soul, all these levels. Like we learned with the uh, with with, with Hannah's uh, description of her brother's experience that his life was divided into milliseconds, good and not so good, good and better. So every level has its own set of angels. Okay, so what do we see here? That a person who does not keep even the teachings of the sages is going to be called a rasha which makes it even more difficult to understand who is a Benini and why if a Benini never does any transgressions of the Torah, never does any transgressions even of the sages, and now add another factor, he's very involved with his neighbors to ensure, to encourage them that they also should keep every teaching, every holy teaching of our tradition. Because every teaching is holy. Every teaching is godliness. Every teaching is a connector between us and the infinite. That's why these teachings are here for us. They're a gift. They're not a, a, an obligation. A, 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 a problem for us. They're a, they're a gift. You know, there's a story I heard once from Rabbi Groner, and it's a well-known story. It's brought in Medrashim as well. 
of a person on a hot summer's day climbing a mountain with a heavy, heavy sack on his back. And they start to say, what are you doing in the hot, sweltering heat? And you're carrying this heavy sack up this difficult mountain. And what do you got in that sack? He says, rocks, rocks. Would you like another rock? Go, go, don't make fun of me and my suffering. Leave me alone. Chases him away. Now we have the same scene, same, same exact identical scene. And the prince says, what have you got in this heavy sack that you're lugging it up the mountain? He says, diamonds. Would you like another? I have a diamond. Would you like one? I'd love one. Sure. Be happy to have it. So why is it's a metaphor for a person who looks on his religion as a, a, a sack of heavy rocks, useless rocks. It's just you're, you're, it's been dumped on you. Or if you understand that every stone is precious, priceless, val of infinite value, then you're always happy to have another. You have a completely different attitude towards, your towards yourself and towards your life. And now we have another thing. It's not just a Russia, a wicked person it could be somebody who doesn't, uh, who, who does negative things. What about a person just says, oh, give me a break. You know, I'm tired. Uh, I just want to relax. So uh, there's a law about a city that turns to idol worship. Well, that city, if it's whole city or a majority of a city turns to idol worship, the city has to be destroyed. And the reason is because the inhabitants of that city despised the teachings of Hashem. Here Hashem gave them holy teachings and they didn't care. They turned to idols instead. The city has to be destroyed and no one can ever live there. Well, the sages took that verse key at the bottom of page 40 very bottom the last paragraph there key dvar hashem bozo the people there despised the word of god so the sages said that applies to anybody who doesn't learn torah when he has a chance if you have a chance to go to a torah class or to pick up a torah book <laughs> And instead, you choose to do something else. Go shopping. That's fun. I want to relax. I want to go shopping. So that's that says, Dvar Havaya Baza, a person despises the, the teachings of Hashem. He chorus to chorus. Therefore, the, the life of that person is going to be cut short. So page 41 now. It's obvious then, Sheet, it's obvious that this person who despises the, the teachings of God is more worthy of being called a Russia than someone who doesn't reach out and try to help his neighbor. That's called Bittul Torah, Bittul Torah. Bittul Torah means you had a chance to learn Torah and you didn't do it. Instead, you watched a ball game. Somebody, but you know, don't get depressed. Somebody once came to the Rebbe and said, Rebbe, what am I going to do? My son, all he wants to do is play baseball. He doesn't, he's not interested in learning. Rebbe, what's going to be? It's in the Talmud. It says in the Tanya, he despises the word of God. Rebbe says, don't worry about it. He'll be okay. He'll be okay. It's a clean Yetzirah. Baseball is a Yetzirah because it takes you away from doing something good. So it's a Yetzirah, it's not a Yetzirah type, but it's clean. It's a clean Yetzirah. There are other words, Yetzirahs, which are much worse. Don't be too upset. When you have children, girls, and they're not living up to your ideals, the ideals that you embraced in your path of tshuva, children, you know, they're just kids. Can't expect them to be on such a high level as you are. You have to gently, gently bring them into the to the point where they appreciate the Torah and mitzvahs that they're being given. So it's always a problem. It is a problem. The Baal Tshuva is loves a Baal Tshuva very often has a passionate love 
of Torah and mitzvahs. Now, a person who's brought up in a, in a from home doesn't have that. It's just natural. In fact, it's the opposite. He's curious. What's all the, all the world doing? Looks like fun. Want to know about it? Very hard for a family to navigate with such uh, inclinations. Okay, so what do we lead to conclude back on page 41 again? That the Bainani is not guilty of any transgressions, even this very uh, subtle transgression of not using out every single second. I mean, Rabbah was so great. We said yesterday, Rabbah was so great. He was learning Torah every single second. The angel of death couldn't take him. His time was up. He didn't live long, you know. Rabbah only lived 40 years. But he accomplished so much. He accomplished in 40 years what Rebbe Akiva took, uh, Rebbe Akiva 120. The Arizal, who we're going to meet over and over again in this class, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria. Anybody have relatives by the name of Luria? Often we have in this class Lurianic relatives. The master, the, the master teacher of, the, of mysticism, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, only lived to the age of, I think, 41. 39, something like that. But, but their, their service Hashem was so intense, they accomplished in a very short time what takes other people ages. So, so that means that the Bainani doesn't have this sin of neglecting a, a moment of Torah. Rabba never neglected. Rabba was never, the lips of Rabba never stopped saying words of Torah. If you look closely sometimes at it, you, have, you see a tzaddik or a video of a tzaddik, you see his lips are always moving. What's he saying the whole time? Well, it says that Tzemach Tzedek, the third Lubavitcher Rebbe, from the time that he walked from one end of the best base measure to the other, he could review a whole tractate in, in, in the Talmud, in his mind. Not bad, huh? Okay. And they're conk. So that's what Rabbah was like. So, so therefore, Rabbah could think he was a Benini because it comes out that a Benini also never misses a, a second when he could be learning Torah. Now let's turn the page, 42. We have to clear up another thing, which is this well-known from the time of Rosh Hashanah that we're judged on Rosh Hashanah. People who have a majority of good deeds will be written down in the book of life for the year to come. We pray that that should be our lot. We should be written down for a book of life. We should be able to have the opportunity to do a lot of mitzvahs and learn a lot of Torah. And people who don't have a majority, they do make mistakes. They make mistakes. They make transgressions. We all make, we're only human, you know. Forget to say yalla v'yavoy. By accident, and the prayers for the, for the Holy Sabbath, you say a weekday prayer instead of the Sabbath prayer. He says, a person starts like that, he has to look into his deeds, what's going on with him. Why, doesn't, why is he saying a weekday prayer on the Holy Sabbath? Doesn't he know that it's the Sabbath? Doesn't he understand? Oh, you know, we make mistakes. These are little transgressions. What about a person who shortchanges somebody in business? That's stealing. I didn't mean it, you know. I thought it was okay. <clears throat> well, if he has some transgressions, but not a majority, then he could still be written down in the book of life because his majority of the things he does are good. Some are not so good, but others are good. They're all good. So he gets written down in the book of life, but you can't say, that he's a tzaddik because the things that are not so good, a tzaddik doesn't do any of them. Are you with me? Everybody with me? You're following the discussion, what we're dealing with? 
So what he wants to say here is, a, so this is very confusing because it says, well, if you do a majority of good deeds, you're called a tzaddik. And if, you're, if your good deeds are not a majority, or if your bad deeds are not a majority, you're still not called wicked. You're not written down in the book of the wicked for extermination. So therefore, the Alter Rebbe has to clear this up and say, look, that's just using um, metaphoric language for the case, for the dealing with judgment on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. But the real essential terms of righteous and wicked and intermediate are different. They're on a, they're a much higher level. Now we get that, now we can start. That's all by way of introduction. This has all been an introduction. So now he says here, it's this, these terms of righteous and wicked is for Rosh Hashanah, for who deserves a reward and who deserves to be punished. However, now looking at page 43, the top. Everybody, we got me, we got the place there. Okay, who's a good reader? Who can read the paragraph here? Top of page 43. What? I can't hear a word you're saying. With the, the the small line one or the dark print, the bold print. Um, the, the Hebrew. Okay, Rivka, can you can you read? Sure. Rivka Ram. And however, we seek to truly define the distinct qualities and ranks of tzaddikim and benanim. Now let's find out what what is a tzaddik really? What is a benanim really? Go on. Our sages have remarked that the righteous are judged, i.e. motivated and ruled solely, solely by their good nature, as it is written, and my heart is as good as in me. Oh, now here is a new concept. Who said this? My heart is a void within me. That's King David. King David said that. My heart is empty. Now, the word void in Hebrew is hollow. Hollow. That means two things. Hollow means slain. A, 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 a corpse, a person who was killed is called a hollow. And the word hollow also means an empty space. So David Amelot says, I think it's uh, chapter 109 of Tehillim, does it say there in the bottom? Yeah, 109. Chapter 109, <clears throat> which we read on the 23rd day of the month. King David says, Libi hollow bekirbi. My heart is a an empty void within me. Well, what do you mean empty? How can your heart be empty? Well, speaking spiritually about your heart. And what does it mean by empty? Go on, read the next paragraph, meaning that i.e. David, the author of this verse is void of not David. Yeah, yeah, David, go on. Amen. The author of this verse was void of an evil nature, having slain it through fast. There you go. He, he had conquered his Yetzirahara. Yetzirahara, we learned on the first page of the Tanya, a person has a Yetzir toy, an inclination to good, to do good. We're going to learn that this is part of God. It's a godly thing in, in us. Your Yetzir toy always wants to be connected to God. Your Yetzirahara, your evil inclination, wants to, <clears throat> to enjoy itself, have a good time, play and have a good time. So David the Melech killed his Yetzahara by fasting. Does that mean he was on a big diet? No, fasting is not dieting. Fasting means you know, there's, you can fast not eating food. You can fast by not talking. Call it Tainus Dibur. Not, I'm not going to speak at, at, at all, or I'm not going to allow myself to say anything negative, even if I want to. So in this, in this case, fasting means that he wasn't talking? <clears throat> well, there's different ways. Either he wasn't talking or he didn't allow himself to say anything negative about anybody or even to think anything negative about. If you don't think negative about anybody, you don't say negative about anybody. But whatever it is, it's a conflict. If you kill someone, there's conflict. That means he wanted to and he held himself in. 
until he didn't have to hold himself in anymore because he no longer had the inclination. He had killed it. There's a, a some of the story. Again, I don't know the names of this, but I heard the story a few times about somebody I think came to the Rebbe Maharash, the fourth Rebbe, Rebbe Shmuel. And he asked for a, a correction for a problem, a spiritual problem he was having in his, with his character. And he said, you have to do something like 300 fasts. He said, Rebbe, how can I do 300 fasts? Not eat for 300 days. So he said to him, what do you think fasting is? Not eating, that's called dieting. Fasting means you shouldn't say anything negative. To control the power of speech. That's fasting. A person can undertake to fast for an hour or five minutes, depending on how, how much capacity you have, how strong-minded you are about it. But the only way that you'll ever get, ever get rid of your, of your evil inclination is by fasting by not giving into it, even an inch. It's like, you know, the proverbial encyclopedia salesman. He knocks on the door and the lady opens the door to see who is there and right away sticks his foot in the door so she can't close it. You want to get rid of the Yitzhahara? You don't let it in. Don't give it an opening. And though, that's what David Amel did. So to the extent that his heart was empty within him. So that's what it means. We learned before, tzaddikim are judged by their good inclination. Now here he defines it. That means to say that they are ruled over by the, the, the decisions they make about what they're going to do with their life come from only their good inclination. The evil inclination has been destroyed. Wow. When I came to Lubavitch the first time, and I'd, I'd been involved with Lubavitch for about a half a year, seven months, I came to see the Rebbe for Tishrei. I was here for Tishrei. And I went back to the community I was living in, in England. And one of the Hasidim there said to me, no, what was it like? When you did, you, what did you see when you saw the Rebbe? I, I don't know. I saw the Rebbe. I didn't know how to answer him. He said, "Well, what you saw, you see, and explain to me. You saw a person who was a, completely in control of himself, by which he was trying to explain to me that, in his opinion, at least." The, the, this description of a person who killed his evil inclination, that could be applied to the Rebbe. Wow. About anybody else, I don't know. Now go on. Um, Rivka, you're doing great. Next paragraph. But, but whoever has not attained... But whoever has not attained the degree of ridding himself of his evil nature, even though his virtues outnumber his sins, is not at all at the level and rank of God. So here you go. He spells it out quite clearly here, that if a person is not on this level of having destroyed the evil inclination, and by the way, where is the evil inclination? Where is it found? How do you, how do you get to it? So the Tanya is going to describe to us that it's in the left side of your heart. It's in the left, the, the seat where, where it likes to hang out, where it likes to, where it feels comfortable and in control is in the left side of your heart. And if a person has not achieved this level of banishing the Yetzirah from the left side of his heart, so it's in total exile, either destroyed or it's in prison. It's, it's sent to a place where it can have no effect on society at large. Then he's not a tzaddik. 
So that tells us who the tzad, tzaddik, in other words, is in, is in control of the left side of his heart. He does not have a Yetzirah. And if he th- you think he does have a Yetzirah, then he, he, he's not, he can be very re- religious, but he's not a tzaddik. He's struggling with his Yetzirah all, all the time. I'll tell you this story at least 10 times during the course of this year. I saw it once I was present at a Purim for Brengen. There was a Hasid there who asked to speak in front of the Rebbe. So his fellow Hasidim wanted to kill him. <laughs> you don't speak in front of the Rebbe. You don't speak in front of the king. The Rebbe smiled and said, yeah, let him speak. So he said, when he was shikr, he was Purim, you know, so people get drunk on Purim. So in his, in his uh, semi-inebriated state, he wanted to tell a story. What was the story he told? And the Rebbe enjoyed the story. He said there was a Hasid and, a, and, a, and a, an, an opponent of Hasidism, a regular kind of a guy. And the Hasid said to the, to the opponent of Hasidism, he said, you know, I struggle with my Yetzirah. We fight. We're always fighting. Sometimes he gives me a good punch in the nose. He gets the better of me. And sometimes I give it to him, but good. Even better. I hit him over the head with a baseball bat. <laughs> you want to see what it's like when I give it to the Sahara, you'll come to me at Mincha time tomorrow. That was the story he told. And then he sat down. The Rebbe smiled. He liked the story. Because it teaches a lot of things. Like, you don't just get the better of the Yetzirah and it's all over. The Yetzirah is compared in the Talmud to a fly, a pesky fly. Everyone in the country, when the fly comes around, you chase it away and it keeps on coming back and coming back and coming back when you want to go to sleep or when you want to relax. And you're always chasing it away. So that's the Yetzirah is like, it keeps on coming. It doesn't give up. It doesn't give, it keeps on coming back. And as, as strong as you get, it gets strong too. As much as you learn, your Yetzirah learns all the same stuff. He knows all the answers. <laughs> so if a person doesn't get rid of this Yetzirah, or in order to get rid of it, you have to plan ahead, prepare, from today till tomorrow afternoon, just to give him such a, a friend of mine said his Zayda, I always used to, him, used to say to him, you have to give the Yetzirah a punch in the nose. And if, if you haven't knocked him out, totally knocked him out and destroyed him, he, he, he's out of the fight altogether, then you're not a tzaddik. Halavai, we, we would wish that you could be a Benini. And this is where I'm going to conclude on this next bit here. Rivka, you're doing great. Read the next bit. Please go over to the next page, too. This, this, this is, is why our sages have expounded the almighty souls of righteous refuse he arose and planted, i.e., and spread them in every generation. In other words, the Abisha saw that the, if this is what a tzaddik is, that he kills his Yetzirah, how many of them are there? Not very many. So therefore, the Abishta took them and made sure that it, there was at least one. Like in this week's Parsha, how does it start off? Noyah was a righteous person in his generation. Was there anybody else? Mm-mm, no. He was the only, he was the righteous person of his generation. And Avraham, our father, our holy father, Avraham, was the righteous person of his generation. His father was a wicked person. His father was an, a, an idol maker. That was his business, the rich man. There's a lot of money in idols, girls. American Idol, there's a lot of money in it. And Aram's father made them. He was from a holy family, but he'd gone off the tracks. And Avram eventually brought him back. He, did, he, 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 he ended his life better. Then he made them. His brother Haran wasn't much better either. Avram and Sarah were unique. They were uniquely righteous in their generation. So there are very few. Hashem put 
And every generation put them out. Thank you very much, girls. We'll continue tomorrow. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Yes. Let everybody take this exercise for the day. See if you can find a moment, one moment in the day, when you have a strong impulse to do something not right. I had in the morning when I and you you didn't give into it. Like remember to say about how great you Remember, remember to say uh, after brought on your cup of coffee.